and give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To our, uh, to our pastor, first lady, to the elders, the ministers, missionaries, deacons, and everybody in the household of faith, we're going to go into a word of prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come to you as humble as we know how, God. We thank you for this day. Thank you for this time, oh God. Thank you for seeing another week to bring us here on, on one accord, oh God. Dear Lord, we ask that you would have your way in this service, oh God. Dear Lord, use me to speak, oh God. Lead me and guide me with your Holy Spirit, oh God. Direct me, oh God. Give the people ears to hear and a heart to receive, oh God. Dear Lord, we ask that you would just flow and have your way. Satan, the Lord rebuke you, and the hand of God is against you on every hand. You have no power in this place in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, we praise you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You can, you can have your seats. If you will, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. We're going to start off, start off at verse number five. And it says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. We're going to be pulling our text from verse number six. I'm going to read verse six one more time. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. I'd like to speak to you all today from the subject, secret place. And the meaning, the direction that Jesus is given in this text is having a legitimate, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. When nobody else is there, when nobody else is around, nobody sees but God, nobody hears but God, having a true and authentic relationship with him. That's something that's important for all of us as believers, but with it being Youth Sunday, that's something that as young people you can take into your life and you're going to benefit as a result of it. It doesn't just apply to the older, the older youth, early college, high school, but if you're, young enough, if you're old enough, you can understand what I'm saying. Take this into your life, develop a prayer life with God, and you'll, you'll have a better life as a result of it. This is talking about being in the confines of your home. Uh, you know, some people travel a lot. Whatever the case may be, wherever you are, the idea is that you should have some type of secret time and a secret place to spend with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks in our text of not being as hypocrites who pray and are seen out in the open. They're in the synagogues in the corner of the streets. And the reason why they're doing that is they just want to be seen. That's not saying that we can't pray in front of people. We should, but we just have to be authentic and real about it. What Jesus said here was a part of his Sermon on the Mount. It's where we hear, I won't say familiar passages of Scripture, but you know, popular passages of Scripture. If you've been in church for a while, you hear the Beatitudes that says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You see, turn the other cheek, which you know so many people talk about in the church and in the world. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, and you also see, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And there was just so much in this sermon, there's just so much power in this sermon, but that's where our text comes from. And leading up to our text, and, you know, starting at the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus talks about how to give alms. That's given to the poor and the needy. That's, he says pretty much the same thing that he says with prayer in our text. Don't do it to be seen. If you're going to do it, be genuine about it, be real about it, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Getting back to our text, it says, don't praise the hypocrites, dude. Don't do it in a way that they would do to be seen. And they have their reward because of that. It says, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, that's when you pray. One, you know, one commentator puts it that every Jewish house had a secret place of devotion. Um, I know some people have prayer, prayer rooms. I know of one in particular, and I did hear about another one this morning who has a prayer room. 
Um, and what it's basically getting out, getting at is have, having the, the secret place to be in. Um, yeah, it's just getting at having the secret place to be in and where you talk. Some translations say enter into thy room. But it says, pray to thy father, translate to our father in secret, and him seeing in secret will reward you openly. That's a one-on-one relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to talk a little bit about the importance of one-on-one relationships. Oftentimes in life for the older, you know, you may have your spouse. For the youth, you have your friends, you have your teammates, you have different people that for whatever, for one reason or another, you've developed a close relationship with them. It may have come over time, over the course of years, but somehow, some way, you've developed a relationship. For the people that are playing sports, you have your teammates. You might have 50 people on your team, 10 people on your team, but you might, may also have that one person that you're really close with. That relationship is developed because of you put time in and you built that relationship and y'all been through some things together that allows you to have strength in that relationship. Just as this, but to a more important degree, our, our relationship with God takes work and it takes time in, in secret and developing our relationship with him. Another thing about one-on-one relationships is the confidentiality that comes with them. Sometimes you will say more, you will admit more. Like I said, you might have a group of friends to the young people. You might be at the lunch table, wherever it is. And when the 10 people are around, y'all might have some type of conversation. But when it's just you and another person, y'all talking the way that you want around everybody else. Whenever we are in our secret place with God, we'll talk about more. We'll have an authentic, more authentic prayer, and we'll speak about more. And that's not saying that people, when they pray in front of people, are being fake or anything. We, we have open prayer at our church. We should have it. But you're just going to say more when you pray to God, and you're going to go more in the depths of your heart when you pray to God in secret. To go along with that, he's above us before. He's, he's there for us before and above anybody that we can possibly have a relationship with. He understands us. He knew who we were before we were made. He knows the number of hairs on our head. And times where we may need encouragement, where we look at a friend, we need to look to God. You know, we may have fear may need direction. If you just need somebody who understands, like I said, he knows the number of hairs on your head, so he knows your situation even better than you do. So just go to him and talk to him. When we look at the word secret, secret by definition is not known or seen or not meant to be known or seen by others. Again, that's not known or seen or not meant to be known or seen by others. There should be an element of our relationship with God where only him and us know what we're doing. And as our text says, when we pray to the Father that is in secret and he sees it, he shall reward us openly. The word shall is a synonym to the word will, meaning it's going to happen. If Jesus said it, then it's going to happen. He said he shall reward us openly so we can depend and trust that when we pray to God in secret, he will reward us openly. It doesn't say might, doesn't say can, doesn't say may, but it says shall. And a reward from God is greater than any other reward that we can get. It's better than any trophy that we may receive, anything you can get on the job, any friendship you can get, any money, any gift that you can get, a reward from God is better than any of that. At the same time, he can reward you with some of those things. I know oftentimes as youth, it's, it's a little tough or it's a little bit hard. And of course, I've, I've grown up too, so I know it's a little bit hard to show your faith and show who you are, especially on the on the school grounds, when you're playing sports, when you're doing dance, it's kind of hard sometimes to show that you're saved. And, you know, the world is against being saved, so it's a tough thing. And with me talking about being in this secret place, that doesn't mean be a secret Christian. We're still supposed to be, we're still supposed to go out and witness to the world, let our light shine. And and you being a youth and you doing that, you'll set a, a crazy example because, believe it or not, there are people out there that are looking for that, and they need you. God could be speaking to you. And you could be that one person that can make a change whatever your environment is. And just getting at the idea of not being ashamed of Christ and, and telling people about him and witnessing, Mark 8 warns against being ashamed. If you're ashamed of him on this earth, then when he comes in the glory of his father and the holy angels, he'll be ashamed of you. But getting back to alone time, there's times where you can be in the presence of the Lord and you'll feel so good to the point where you just, you just don't want to do anything else. You, you don't want to go out into a sinful world. You just want to stay where you're at. And that's just how it feels when you're in the presence of the Lord. I know one time, the first time I spoke, I, talk about, I talked about praying before a game and, and having a performance where I scored a lot of points. But I can think of a moment when I was in prep school and I just decided to throw on some gospel that, that I had heard growing up on one of my father's CDs. And it just touched me. I was 
mean, I was just chilling in my room. I had my beats on. And, of course, my guess is that nobody else on the team was listening to gospel. But I just threw that on. I had peace. I had a good game. And he'll do those types of things. He'll reward you. Personally, me being in the presence of the Lord it gives me peace, gives me a sound mind, makes me calm. Um, I have a very calm demeanor, but sometimes my mind just goes a 1,000 miles per, per hour. If you come to my place, I have notes all over the place where ideas come up. But he just gave me that, that perfect peace, that, that peace that nobody can understand. It reminds me of Psalm 23 where he'll lead you beside the still waters. I feel a sense of boldness against the enemy and power when I call on the name of Jesus. When I'm in the presence of the Lord, I feel invincible. It's not that I feel invincible myself, but when you have the God of the Bible on your side, the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in between, when you have him on your side, you will have a sense of boldness. When the devil tries to come, come against you, when he tries to put you to sleep or put you, make you ashamed of getting out there and witnessing, he'll give you that boldness and that courage. Moses got to spend some quality alone time with God. When we look at chapter 34 of Exodus, Moses was in the presence of the Lord to the point where his face was radiant and it had a glow. I heard somebody say one time that when you have an anointing on your life, the world may see it. They may not know exactly how to, how to take it or what to say, but they'll just be like, there's something different about you, man. They're like, there's just something different. I was talking to my brother one time, and he said, this person came up to me on my job. I was like, man, you don't cuss. And to them, that was just so strange. But people would no notice something different about you when you're in his presence and you're living for God. In verse 3, we see specific direction from God to Moses to be alone. So we see that that's important to God. It says, no man shall come up, no man shall be seen throughout the mount, neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before that mount. That is, alone. Moses was given instructions, and he was given commandments. And that's another thing. When we go into the presence of the Lord, he'll give us instruction. He'll give us directions. He'll show us where to go. Now, Moses was there for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm not going to lie. That's a long time. But he was there, and God sustained him. And that's, not, that's actually not the first time he did it. But God sustained him, and God was there for him. There's been times where just being in the presence of the Lord, fasting and, and praying, that's literally changed my life. I remember before getting a job that I have now, I, was, I laid before the Lord the night before, and I literally got a text the next day, and it, and it led down the road to me getting a certain job. So he will reward you. Sometimes, like I said, you may not feel like doing it, but you do it. With all that he's done for us, it's... It's, it's our obligation to do it. We should want to do it. And to go along with that, I talked about the feeling that you have. There's just no feeling like being in the presence of the Lord. Now, this is a key part of our relationship with Jesus Christ is to have some type of a long time with him. I believe as Christians, we should have some time every single day where we talk to the Lord. To the young people, I can just remember being young and having a prayer life. You may, you may not have your, you know, of course, you don't have your own house yet or whatever the case is, but just, just jump on the side of your bed. Your, your parents will respect that and they'll honor you. Just jump on the side of your bed and talk to them from a young age all the way up, but have that alone time with them. That can be in the morning. That can be in the evening. That can be when you're driving. That can just be any time when you just still away and have some alone time with God. One reason I say that it's important is that in this day and age, the world is just getting more and more evil. The things that the youth are facing now is it's just crazy. I can, you know, I, I talk to people that are in a, a generation kind of above me. Of course, our pastors in a different generation, and there's different ages in this church. And my generation deals with some crazy things. And the one coming after me, the world's getting crazier and crazier by the day. That's because we're in the last days. First Timothy chapter four tells us that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. And people's conscience will be seared with the hot iron. We live in a world where people don't have morals, they don't have standards, and that's because people's conscience just has been seared by the world that we live in. There's constant things through the media outlets, just day-to-day -day walk and conversation. People just don't have any reverence or respect, and people's conscience is getting seared and, and, and getting destroyed. Even looking at my last two jobs that I've had before the one I have now, I was in a sales environment. And... I learned a lot of good things from sales about communicating. I took a lot of good from it. But one thing that I really learned is people are very slick with words. And that's just me talking about being in the, being in the world that we live in where people's conscience are being seared. When I say people are slick with words, this is one thing that you really have to understand as a young person that I, that I didn't necessarily understand. I thought that what's from God is obviously from God, and it's just, it, it is, but 
it just appears as good and what's evil just appears as evil. This is demonic. I can tell this is evil. It's going to be a big red flag. But sometimes the things that are evil, they can seem like they're good. And that's what you have to understand when I talk about people being slick with words and people trying to deceive you and say all types of different things and it really be a trap and be a bad thing. For some of you that are, that are going to college, I experienced some of this on a college campus and believe it or not, some of the people that are the most heathenistic or they might seem like they're all the way off, they might be the quickest ones to really come to Jesus. There's times where it can be people that are Christians or so-called Christians and they'll be living any kind of way. And I'm not going to lie, when I, when I saw that, I was kind of like, I, like, I know I'm not tripping. It's just kind of like, it, it just kind of messed with me a little bit. I'm like, you're supposed to be a Christian, but yet you're doing this. And you have people, and especially in college, this is something I didn't see until I got to college, is you'll have people out there claiming to be a Christian, but they're doing any and everything that they're big and bad enough to do. And like I said, some people that talk smooth, our pastor talk about fame words in Second Peter. Um, even people that teach using the Bible. We live, we live in a world where social media is so prevalent, and that's not me bashing people that minister over social media because I found good people for sure, but everybody has something to say. Somebody can sit in their room and put up a video and spread it out to the whole world, and they can say they're talking from the Bible and not even say anything from the Bible, and you won't know unless you go out there and check it out for yourself. So we live in a world where so many people are saying so many different things and even using the Bible but teaching wrong doctrine. And that's where we need discernment. Yeah. Discernment is something key that you can pray for as youth. As I said before, I've said it in an earlier message, but discernment is not age-friendly. Wisdom is not age-friendly. So you want to pray for these things at an early age, and God will direct you and lead you through life. And I debated if I did want to say this or not, but whenever we hear our pastor talk about, and I'm still talking about conscience being seared with the hot iron, and you don't want to be deceived, but we hear our pastors so oftentimes he'll bring up the issue of a homosexual lifestyle being matched with being black or being African American. It's clear that one is a sin and one is not, but that's, that's common sense. But when your conscience is seared with the hot iron, common sense is not so common. And that's what happens whenever you're con constantly have different things pushed on you that shouldn't be there. And with it being Youth Sunday, and I'm, I'm going to get to the better part, but I'm just talking about the world that we live in. With it being Youth Sunday, I just want to talk a little bit more about the world that we live in. We live in a world that there's no light and dark, there's no black and white, there's no right and wrong, but everybody has their own truth. The Bible clearly, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody shall come to the Father but by me. But we live in a world where there's so much going on and everybody has their own ideas and their own things and everything they want to bring to the table. I mentioned social media. Uh, I saw something recently that depicted Jesus as a homosexual on Netflix. That's the world that we live in. That's the world that everybody in here that's young is coming up. Some of the older people might not understand, but it's getting worse, and that's the world that we're coming up in. Um, all the TV shows have lying and cheating and drugs and sex scenes on TV, and that's considered to be a good show. You can't, that, that's the way everybody's talking about. If it's a good show, it has those things in it. I talked about music the first time that I spoke, and that's probably something that I'm always going to bring up because music has such a strong influence on the world that we live in. There's a reason why men treat women the way they do, calling them out of their name, calling them all types of different things. There's a reason why women carry themselves the way that they do because of the world that we live in, the, the music and the things that, that are put in our ears. When you constantly put these things in your head, it goes into your lifestyle. And that's why we see less marriages. We see just all types of, you know, people killing themselves. They, they push drugs and different things like that so much in music, but then you'll see somebody commit suicide. That's not the track that you want to follow. It may seem appealing just because everybody's on it, just because everybody does it doesn't mean it's right. What you're learning in this church as a youth and just as a member in general is right, and don't let the world get out there and tell you anything different. We live in a generation that wants to be without God and the truth that he said, but God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. The truth that he said are going to stand the test of time. Don't fall for the things of this world because at the end of the day, the truth that God has said is what's going to take you through, and that's what's going to last at the end. Oftentimes in this ministry, we've heard of the Bereans, and they received the word with all readiness, readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They were hungry. They wanted to know for themselves. They wanted to know who God was and they just, they just had a hunger for it. With that same hunger, 
we must seek to know God ourselves. We must seek to have a legitimate relationship with God in secret so when other people see us, whenever the world sees us, they see an example of a true Christian, of a true believer. But yeah, we want to be in, living in secret in such a way that when the world sees us, they, they know that we're true Christians because there's so many people that are living false out there that, that there's going to have to be somebody who's real. There's going to have to be somebody that sets the standard that draws a line and shows what a real believer is. Us having a legitimate relationship with God shows us how to show somebody else how to live right. We teach, we learn, we teach, we learn, we teach, and the ultimate teacher is Jesus. What we learn from him, we put that inside of us and we go out and show the world. Something that we talked about earlier in minister's class, you're going to get asked tough questions by the world, and this is really important for you. Um, it's, it's important for everybody, but just in my walk with God, I've especially when I worked at the gym, people will come at you all types of crazy and, and you don't want to get exposed. You want to, have a legitimate re, you want to have a legitimate relationship with God so that whenever people ask you different things, you're able to answer. You might not even know. I remember I had an hour-long conversation one time and before I knew it, the conversation was over. I was like, where did that come from? The Holy Spirit will lead you. If you spend time with him, he'll lead you and guide you. If, if you hesitate to... to talk to your teammates, like I said, or talk to people at your school, he'll lead you and he'll guide you. You're not going to know everything to do. I personally, I'm not a perfect man. I don't know everything to do, but I can trust that because of my alone time with God, he'll lead me and guide me and direct me and what I need to say. Other times your faith is going to be tried. You're going to face so many different things, but when your faith is tried, like I said, you want to be able to depend on the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, there were the seven sons of one Sceva, and they tried to call on the name of Jesus, but they really didn't know him. And what happened there is they got exposed. And like I said, we just, we just don't want to get exposed. The world can see a fraud, but they can also see what's real. It might not always be a situation where it's what you say. Then again, it could be what you say. It could just be how you live, how you live your lifestyle. People could study you over the course of years. They could study you over a few months. They could study you the first time they meet you and see what comes out of your mouth. And they might not have any Bible in them. You might be that Bible for them. But whenever that comes up, you want to be real about it. The world can see fake, but they can also see real. And we want to be like that. We, we want to be true examples. We want to be true witnesses. We want to be true believers. And that gets back to my point of having a true relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I've talked enough about what the devil can do and, you know, the things that this world has to offer. But let's talk about what's really important and who we get to pray to in secret. We get to talk to the creator of this world. We get to talk to the great I am. We get to talk to a God who's mighty, who's strong, who knows and who sees. He's above anything that we can ever face. He's above any situation, any trial that may come up. When we need leadership and direction, we can depend on Jesus. For Proverbs says that in all thy ways to acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. It doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. It doesn't matter if you're big or you're small. But Jesus will lead and direct you. Be in that secret place. For I hear psalmists say, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We serve an Almighty God. We serve a powerful God, a God that's true, a God that knows, a God when we need direction, he'll lead us, a God that we can call on the name of Jesus and we can expect him to move. In the name of Jesus, you can get that scholarship. In the name of Jesus, you can have straight A's. In the name of Jesus, you can go into marriage as a virgin. In the name of Jesus, you can live a fruitful life. In the name of Jesus, you can be prosperous. In the name of Jesus, all things consist and exist. Everything that was created is because of Jesus. He's mighty. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above anything that we can ever ask or think. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about a mighty God. And if we would call on him, he would show us great and mighty things that we don't know. If he did it for Jeremiah, then surely he'll do it for you and me. If he did it for Moses, then surely he'll do it for you and me. He did it for Paul and he did it for Silas. And surely he'll do it for you and me. To my young people, if he did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, surely he'll do it for you and me. We serve an awesome God. We serve a mighty God. A God who knows and a God who sees. A God who hears and a God who cares. For we can cast all our cares upon him knowing that he cares for us. There's not a thing that our God can't handle. In the name of Jesus, we can be healed. In the name of Jesus, we can be set free. 
In the name of Jesus, we can be delivered. There's nobody stronger than our God. There's nobody more mighty than our God. There's nobody can touch our God. There's not a devil in hell that can stop anything that God has for us. Because if God be for us, then who can be against us? We serve the great I am. We serve a holy God. We serve a worthy God. We serve a God that's pure and that's holy. We serve a God who's able to do so much more than we can ask. We serve a God who's there. And I'm talking about that name of Jesus. That name of Jesus. That name of Jesus is above any other name. Hallelujah. And in my closing, I want to touch on a few points. We don't want to be hypocrites, as our text says, but we want to be, have a true relationship with God in secret. Just as we develop our relationships with our friends, we want to develop our relationship with God to a higher degree. We should seek to have alone time with God every day. That's where our strength is going to come from. That's where our strength lies. We don't want to be deceived, and we don't want to be exposed. We need to have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ so that we can be witnesses, so that we can show the world how they should live and how they should carry themselves. Finally, as our text says, he shall reward us openly. Now, what greater reward is there than a reward from God? What relationship can we have than one that's better than one with Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? So I would encourage everyone, if you're not saved, get saved. And as Christians, we should have our secret time, our secret place with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for God's word. Thank God for his word. At this time, I'd like to open up the altar. If there's anybody who's unsaved, who doesn't know God.